Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education by Kate Colbert and Joe Salustio with contributions by Elvin Freitas is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Get your Kindle edition or your softbound book. It's going to be amazing. Advanced 360 Education is a data-focused digital marketing company with proven positive outcomes for educational institutions. To learn more, visit a360education.com or call Anthony Espinosa at 310-704-5369. That's Advanced 360 Education. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Edup Experience Podcast, where we make education your business. Joe Salustio back with you again. Please remember, ladies and gents, you're going to hear this all the time now since our, our book, Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education, just went up on Amazon for pre-order. We already hit a hot new release uh, ranking, which we're so excited you can uh, buy a copy on Amazon. If you'd be so kind, this is not me begging, but it is me almost begging for you to buy the book. And then uh, obviously you can visit commencementthebook.com, which is our website, find out how you can get involved. We have a survey out there of higher ed leaders. We're gonna include all those insights in the book of the survey. Anyway, we've got a book out, buy it if you want, don't buy it if you don't want, uh, but uh, we're gonna put it out anyway. Uh, and we're really excited about it. I'm also excited about this podcast as we march on. Elvin told me today, he sent me a text and said he thinks by the end of the year, we'll have interviewed over 200 college presidents in total. I don't know how many we've done this year. I feel like I've interviewed a lot of amazing and brilliant folks, uh, but getting to a 200 college and university presidents would be pretty spectacular. We're excited about that. So many milestones being set and then broken. Again, uh, as I tell everybody who's listening, I, I interview people every single day at lunch, every single day at lunch. And that is not stopping today. Uh, I have a guest with me, so you don't have to hear me talk anymore. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to bring her on right now. Her name is Dr. Maureen Murphy, and she's president at the College of Southern Maryland. Maureen, how are you? I'm well today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. All right. So, Maureen, a uh, level set for us. We always like to say to our guest, what do you do at the College of Southern Maryland, and how do you do it? So tell us about the college. Okay, the College of Southern Maryland serves the part of Maryland that hangs down below DC between the Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac River. We serve three counties. We have four campuses in those three counties. Three of them are full service. We have a, a fairly large student body. We run somewhere around 20,000 students and really Fully half, maybe a little over half of those are in our workforce development arm. So our workforce footprint is actually larger than our traditional credit degree seeking footprint. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. And we, we serve the defense community very um, uh, in, a, in a large way. We have two very large and important naval bases here, Patuxent River Naval Air Station. And we have the Indian Head uh, Naval War Center. So we're kind of STEMI, and we do a lot of STEM work with our DOD partners. So you have more, say that again, you have more workforce development students. Does that imply non-degree seeking students or stackable yes, credential yes, yes. kind of students? Talk well, about that a little bit. Yes and no. Yes. Um, sure. Workforce development has, a, our workforce development programs um, have a lot of different functions. Many of them are entry-level programs that will get you into degrees. They can stack, as you mentioned, stackable credentials. Healthcare is a very good example. Um, right now, our healthcare programs are going gangbusters. Uh, COVID has had a positive effect on uh, people's interest in pursuing health careers. Uh, we also have some things that are um, for people who are already in the workforce, already may have degrees for upskilling, particularly a lot of IT and engineering related uh, programs. IT and cybersecurity are developing new subspecialties faster than we can even imagine. I'm sure that there's two new types of cybersecurity programs that have been developed since we've been talking. Yeah, I'm sure, right? And it's, yeah. And considering the, um, it's funny because uh, higher ed is like one of the most hacked or easy to hack uh, industries in the world. And we're teaching people cybersecurity. It's like this jumbo shit, this oxymoron a little bit, right? Where, yeah, uh, it is. So I mean, I, <laughs> there is, uh, 
there's no shortage of, uh, of attempts to hack higher ed. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of closed circuit networks here just to keep our blooming hackers out of our own systems. Uh, we've been, we've been lucky. We've been very yeah. lucky. Well, you know, here's the, here's the question I have for you, Maureen. You're the president of the College of Southern Maryland, yet there's a presidential search going on at the College of Southern Maryland. How could that be possible? And what's happening in your life? <laughs> I am retiring. Um, this is, I, I've started my 16th year as a college president, and it's, uh, thank you, thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's, How, it's, uh, what, what brought you to the, to the decision that it was time to, to hang them up, so to speak? And, uh, what, what, you know, cause I know COVID put a lot of folks, uh, to a stress point and, and they got their institutions through all that and said, you know what, now's a good time for me to exit on a high. Right. Or is that, well, what I, I think you've summarized some of it. I think for me personally, um, it's distance from family and it, it, it's time to be closer to family. And, um, I, it was never a problem in the before times as long as I could travel. Uh, also, the College of Southern Maryland is in a really good spot right now. I mean, it's it's a great time for somebody else to come in. We, sure, there's a lot of work to do, but there's no giant problems that have to be solved. The, the board is terrific. The faculty are awesome. The staff are really supportive. And the issues that we have are those that everybody is having. So it, it's a great time. I, I hope the next... I've got to tell you, I'm very optimistic about the future. I recently attended last April, the American Association of Community Colleges annual convention, and I saw incredible younger people who are coming up with the fire in the belly. Mm. And it's time for the old folks like me to step out of the way. Oh, come on. Fire. There, there is a lot of fire out there. I've inter We've interviewed probably 60 I think I was 60 last time I counted uh, community college presidents and our overall um, span of 170 or however many. There's some uh, just brilliant people that you're coming across in today's community colleges, but dealing with a tremendous amount of issues, right? Um, declining enrollment is definitely one of the issues. Um, equity in higher education, creating access of higher education. You've got the DEI things going on. There's just a lot to deal with as a college president today maybe more than there ever has been before. What kind of advice would you, what, what would you tell your younger self? Uh, 60, <laughs> your younger self 16 years ago when you started as a college president or where, wherever was your start, what would you tell yourself something you know now that you, did, that, uh, well, you didn't know then? Well, first of all, I've got to say it's a different job now from what it was 16 years ago for all the reasons you just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would tell my younger self to just tighten the seatbelt throw your hands in the air and enjoy the ride. It is a ride. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it is, it's never dull. The work is different every single day. Um, and it's the most rewarding thing that you could possibly do. Our job is to do all those things that you said to support our students, to promote their social and economic mobility, to clear the clutter. That's what presidents do. They clear the clutter so that those things can happen, so that others can do that really powerful work. It's important. Yeah, you, you may, that's a, a clear the clutter. I love that. Um, but, you know, being, the job, uh, being in the job of a college president doesn't come without certain um, um, things, say I'm really technical words today, things uh, that you have to deal with, what you say, how you say it, the stakeholders, the constituencies. Um, you know, I was talking to a president recently at a Big Ten university, and he says, you know, you got to be pre prepared at any time to walk away from the job if you can't be yourself. If, if you are, have a board or you have um, stakeholders and the community and you can't be yourself and you're, 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 faking it till you make it every day and you're not being yourself then eventually you're going to drive yourself nuts and um you know i thought that was kind of a profound thing to think about that you if you can't be yourself you can't do the job and talk about that a little bit marine and how sure, you've I, seen I, it I, unfold for you yeah i i think it, i think it's very true um and i think we have those defining moments in our lives uh, the 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 president first of all is generally somebody who reports to a board so you get to have multiple bosses all of those bosses have a political connection. They've either been appointed by somebody who is an elected official or they have run for office themselves. So it's important to understand 
each one of these board members and what is important to them politically, which may not be the same thing that is important to you as an individual. Um, I think we can be, I think we need to recognize that most people get on boards for community colleges because they believe in the mission and they want to make a difference. Um, so it's, it's important to honor that and respect that even if the way of going about it might be different from what you want. We are seeing though in higher education um, and community colleges are not immune that political ideologies are playing out in our campuses in ways they hadn't before. Yikes! Exactly. And I think COVID-19 is a very good example of that. Uh, the politics of vaccinations, the politics of being remote, being in person, masking, all of those things play out on our campuses. If you add to that, you mentioned the DEI stuff. There is a lot of misinformation floating around in public media about what critical race theory is. I will tell you, I didn't see it until I was in my doctoral program. We don't teach it in third grade. Um, the, there's just a lot of polarized tensions that play out on our campuses. And part of my job is to try to mitigate those and to keep us moving forward so that we can go ahead and fulfill our mission for the people who need us. It, it requires a lot of political acumen, a little sensitivity. Um, times I self-censor often, um, but to your point earlier, if I felt I was at a point that my personal integrity or the integrity of the institution was at stake, I would have to step back and self-extract. You gotta look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day. The job doesn't love you back. Mm, good point. Uh, this is as purposeful as our work is, sometimes the individual is not in the right seat at the right time. And you know, it's one of those, yeah. it's one of those jobs, right? Where you go, um, when things are going well, nobody comes up to you and says, good presidenting today. You know, it's, it's <laughs> always, you get the problems. It's like, Oh, somebody did this or something happened there. And we need you to fix it. We need you to get on board. And so you end up in a, sometimes in a reactive space when you know, pro you have to be proactive to help students. So there's so much noise at the highest level of managing, managing different stakeholders. And when your attention is taken away from staff or your attention is taken away from students, that's when you can see institutional problems start to mount because you've, other people are taking your time. And it is all about the students. And as I said at the beginning, and you know this, enrollment declines in community colleges have been stiff. Um, many community colleges now, though, are getting students back. Um, they've had to do tremendous work. So this is what I'm going to ask you about how difficult it has been for you to get your students to return, where did they go? So a lot of students just kind of disappeared at COVID and it's been a lot of intense work to get them re-engaged. Yeah, it, it has been. I mean, uh, first of all, you know, we're fighting a full employment economy and, and community college enrollment is counter cyclical to the economy. So if uh, unemployment is high, so is our enrollment. If unemployment is low, so is our enrollment. Ah. Our, our competition is not other colleges and universities. Our competition Ooh. is not going to college. Yes, that, that, I would love that, right? Because I say that all the time to my staff at my college. I say, we're not competing. I say, we, could, we may compete against another university, but we're competing against convincing a family and a student, an adult student, that going to college still has value. Exactly. And, and you're, you're right about that. I mean, <clears throat> the uh, value of higher education has been called into question over the past five or six years. And there are people who are seriously questioning that. We're also fighting really high wages for low skilled work. And uh, I, I always, you know, when I get DoorDash, I'm always the one out there saying to the young person, so are you in college? Mm. You're not, why aren't you in college? You know, and, and try to, I know you're working, but you go to college and work. And, and I, and, you know, one young man just put it to me this way. He goes, ma'am, I'm making $22 an hour and I work when I want to. I had not, I had no comeback to that. It's, it is interesting, right? Because as technology advances and, and jobs that you would never think could make as much money as they do start making more money. It, it then says you, you get people that say, you know what, I'm just going to do this for longer. And then I'll think about college later. So 
maybe the value of college, and I've thought this before, the, the value of college is in question early before people come back around to it and value it later because they've gotten past some type of phase in their life. And so they're coming to be trained maybe formally for the first time in their 20s, right? Yeah, I think we see, uh, and, and that's, that's a very hard population to serve. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you the, the traditional model of higher education is really not relevant and it's very difficult for us to face it. The two long semesters with the summer off is for an 18 to 22 year old privileged person who has the luxury to go to college full time and not work and then make some money over the summer. That describes very few yep. of our students. Uh, you know, the highly selective, highly rejective, however you want to put it, universities have got that market sewn up. So why are we trying to emulate them when that experience doesn't have anything to do with the lives of our own students? Nailed it. I, exactly. I reject that. I reject that we need to be something that doesn't fit our students' lives. And rather than trying to make our students fit into something that is unnatural to them, it's our responsibility to change ourselves to serve them on their terms and what works with them. At the College of Southern Maryland, 67% of our students are part-time, 80% mm -hmm. of them work full-time, and half of them identify as primary caregivers for people in their families. So tell me how they're going to go full-time, 15 credits fall, 15 credits spring, and make enough money to feed their families in the summer. It doesn't work. Right. Advanced 360 Education is a data-focused digital marketing company with proven positive outcomes for educational institutions. Advanced 360 Education does not simply rely on instinct to make assumptions about audiences or key data points. Rather, through data intelligence, client strategies take on a higher level of effectiveness. To learn more, visit a360education.com or call Anthony Espinoza at 310-704-5369. That's 310-704-5369. That's Anthony Espinoza at Advanced 360 Education. It doesn't work. And, you know, and I've we've talked about this with many people before on the, po uh, on the podcast. It creates a situation when you have 80% of your population in the working learner category. And that's ageless. Working learner can be 20 and a working learner can be 120. Um, but life happens you know, you're not in this protected uh, college environment uh, on campus and, you know, you go get your meal and go to class and get your meal and go to class. Uh, you get in a car accident, your cell phone bill doesn't get paid, your uh, kids uh, have to go get a surgery, and all of a sudden it's putting strain on your discretionary income that you were using to pay for your education. And instead of pushing through, students quit. And that is what retention is in adult uh, working learner spheres is confidence building and trying to promote feelings of grit and perseverance when it seems like the deck is stacked against you. And I know community colleges serve that type of population. That's mm -hmm. hard work, though. It's hard work to convince a student to be confident about their future when their present seems so bleak. Well, I think there's opportunities in that, too. I, we have redesigned a lot of, uh, of our systems. For example, the academic calendar. Now the majority of our classes are seven weeks long. We have six starts a year, so you can start six different times. Um, the faculty have been incredible about going through the redesign process and really looking at the success indicators. We're also in Achieving the Dream College, and we have seen some success with uh, what we call hawk go, we have a protocol, we're, we're the hawks. We are the hawks. Once a hawk, always a hawk, we're hawks. Amazing. That's right. And we have, for our incoming students, we have something called hawk ready, set, go, which involves the orientation and, and you know process through that first set of gateway classes. Hawk go is a strategy developed by our faculty and refined over time of deliberate engagements with students in those high stakes entry level courses in which students get positive reinforcement, they get acknowledgement, they get things very systematically so they don't fall between the cracks. And what we've seen in terms of course completion 
and enrollment in the next course in the sequence after that is just astonishing. Uh, so we have we brought that to scale and we've got over 200 faculty who have been trained in this and been implemented in it and it matters because a lot of times students drop out because no one noticed they dropped in. That's right. And this is a way to make sure that they are not anonymous and that we're rewarding their good work. I can remember as a student getting a paperback and it would say B plus and there'd be no comments. I had no idea what I did right or wrong. I just knew it was pretty good. Okay. You just knew that you made it and you made it on that one piece of paper. Right, right. But could I replicate it? No, because I had no idea what I did. So this is something that we have a system called kudos where we recognize students very deliberately for, for hitting those benchmarks um, that we all have internalized. I love that because, you know, it's like the working learner in their first two weeks of their first course is that time for confidence building because everything in their being says, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. And anything that happens justifies that feeling. Um, and we, we create this cognitive dissonance in our minds when we feel like we can't do something, but we're there and we have these feelings of self-doubt. And there's too much on the line for adult students because you're talking about kids and families and generational wealth. And, and one way to solve these problems of equity and, and you talk about diversity and socioeconomic equality is education because it levels, levels out later. It gives people a means to, to an end. Um, and sometimes we don't recognize that in, in what's happening now, Maureen, and you're, I know you're seeing it. There's these messages that college doesn't have value that, that, and I always go, who's, who's listening? Like, I know that. And I have people come on my podcast and tell me that exact thing. College does not have value anymore. It doesn't have value like it used to. And I imagine myself going home and telling my kids, don't go to college. And I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't bring myself to even think of uttering those words. So I go, who's listening to these college doesn't have value? I, Is it I, I people will tell from you lower economic would... backgrounds who mm -hmm. then it's creating more of an equity gap because they're not getting educated. I, I don't know. I just have a big question about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even if they're, I think also we have a generation of people who see what happened with the great recession and all the college graduates at that time who had a lot of debt who are still in debt because the jobs that were promised at the end of graduation didn't materialize because everything went kind of sideways economically. Uh, so if you couple that with a skepticism of the value of it, um, the sort of political rhetoric that is being hurled at uh, colleges and universities for being bastions of brainwashing people, uh, People who say that, I think, have they ever met somebody who's 20 years old? No, I know. I'm sorry, you can't brainwash them. Um, but you know, if you, it's the confluence of all these things that I think feeds this idea that college does not have value. Plus, I find that most of our students, we've had a project the past couple of years with achieving the dream and trying to up our Pell participation rate. The numbers of students who were availing themselves of Pell Grants uh, mapped against the socioeconomic status of our communities was, was it, it was out of whack. And what we found was that among the working poor, there was this idea that they wouldn't be entitled to any aid because they were working. And the college is much more expensive than you know, most people think it is, particularly community colleges are, are much less expensive than people I don't you know, even think about. And one thing that happened uh, that we realized that just kind of blew me away was how we were talking about financial aid and the language that we were using. And that when people get, uh, when people file a FAFSA, it comes back and it says EFC equals, and then there's a number. What? Yeah, they don't know what that means. That's right. It means expected family contribution equals, and it's a calculation that this is what we expect your family would be able to contribute to your college education. So we had people who were getting EFC equals zero. All they saw was the zero and thought they got no aid when actually they got full aid. See, now, now you're talking like this is the stuff 
this is under the hood stuff. You know, when people talk about, we have to change higher ed and the financial model isn't working. Yeah, 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 yeah. But stuff contributes to that. Like there's these baseline things that, that are really confusing for students. And there's reasons why the financial model isn't working. There's reasons why people question the value of higher ed. There's reasons why people don't, uh, you know, go to school and, and you think about something like that. How confusing is that? That's it's, it's confusing for somebody that has no awareness of financial aid. Absolutely. I mean, I, I will say the FAFSA has gotten simpler, but it's still not simple enough. I, I honestly think that there should just be a box in your tax return that you check that say you want to be considered for federal financial aid. Mm -hmm. Since, you know, fine. Yep. And that information can get kicked over to the Department of Ed. Yep. It'll never be that. Unfortunately, it'll never be. That. No. I, well, you hope someday it will. Um, so, so, you know, you've been in higher ed for like over 30 years. You've been a college president for 16, I think. Um, you're, you're an outgoing, uh, by choice, uh, college president, because that doesn't always uh, work out that way. It's, it's, no, it doesn't. you're sailing into the sunset, uh, by your own choice and your own way. Where do you see you? So you've seen higher ed span itself. You've seen the spectrum over the last 30 years. Where is the industry today? Is it as in trouble as everybody says? Is there as many problems as everybody says there are? Are there actual bright spots? Tell, tell me what you think. Um, I, I think that we need not to uh, paint higher ed with one broad brush. The various sectors have different concerns. I think the research ones um, are going to be fine. Yep. They're self-sustaining entities. They, they've got it down. The regional universities and community colleges are diff have different sets of issues. The small privates are frankly in trouble, uh, particularly those that are tuition dependent. So it, it's what we have is a model that hasn't changed essentially for 200 years. Mm. And it's time to really take a look at it and to value things differently. Um, it's, when you say the model hasn't changed, do you mean like degree, credit hours, and the way we deliver education? And the a lot of those things haven't changed, but the financial model really hasn't changed yeah. either. We tend, you know, we tend to be highly tuition and fee dependent, or we are, you know, if we're in the public sphere, it's tuition and fees plus whatever those allocations are from whatever agencies. Yeah. And all of that is based on, you know, on things that don't translate into what it takes to do the work. It's based on full-time equivalent enrollment, which always disadvantages community colleges because of our part-time students. Yep. That's that's a really common thing that comes up. You know, when you have 60, 70 percent of your part time students and everything's being judged on full time, part time, right. you know, first time freshman full time students. It's like that's not even but who, who, who eventually looks at that and goes, this doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? Well, we do. But, you know, I don't know. Our, our voice is not quite loud enough. Yeah. As I said, the gold standard tends to be, you know, the Ivies and the research wants. But if, if, if you take a look at it, if you're Harvard or Yale, and you accept 3% of your applicants, you're stacking the deck. Mm -hmm. Of course they have terrific outcomes. We're open door. We, bring, we, we want everyone to come in. And that means we're taking on some folks who have some real challenges in their learning. And we're willing to work with them and meet them where they are so we can take them to where they need to go. And sometimes it takes more than one shot. And that's okay. We're there. That's, that's so well said because the infrastructure that you need to do what you said is completely different than an R1 or an Ivy. You don't need to provide that many resources for writing when you're taking somebody on um, who, who maybe isn't that doesn't write that well, you have to provide incredible writing infrastructure so that student can literally learn scholarly writing as they move through a program. You have to provide uh, the retention services uh, are more of a dismantling of in a building of um, a dismantling of excuse and building of confidence as much as it is anything else. And when you're at, at a prestigious Ivy University, 
probably not dealing with that as much. Um, you're dealing with a student who gets in a fender bender and can't put food on the table with a working learner. And that's probably not the case for somebody paying the money that they are at Harvard or Yale. Probably not. I mean, um, you know, food insecurity is rampant among, you know, all students in higher education, but much more so in community colleges. I mean, we've been um, one of the nice things with the, uh, with the funding that we got through uh, through HERF was we were able to open uh, three full service pantries. We'd had six or seven micro pantries before the pandemic, and now we're we're pretty much in the food business. Um, it's it's a shame, but it is. I mean, it, it's what we do. Um, it people struggle, and that traditional that traditional model, whether it's you know the the academic calendar model or the financial model doesn't take into account the different kinds of struggles that different learners have. And, you know, we, we were founded to create access and opportunity for people who didn't have it. And if you really want to level the playing field, we need to have, we need to be resourced appropriately without counting noses or in our case, partial noses, because a whole, mm -hmm. our whole students don't count in these formulas. And you know, without tying it to something that an R1 is doing, there's the funding formulas are really inequitable. Yeah. And if we value, if we value the humans that we serve, if we really believe in equity, if we believe in opportunity, as, as we're supposed to as our American democracy, we will fund those things that promote it. 100%. That's crowd. I call that my disruptive agreement, Maureen. That's a, my disruptive button. Uh, I, I, you know, I like to end every episode with, with the final two questions and give you the platform. Number one, what do you want to say about the College of Southern Maryland that we didn't say yet? Anything else that's coming up, going on, being released, talks you're giving, um, where are you going once you retire, any trips or anything <laughs> you want to say about yourself or the College of Southern Maryland? And then number two, what do you see as the future of higher education? The College of Southern Maryland is a jewel. It absolutely is a jewel. This is the only place I have worked in which I have seen such passion for the students among everybody here. I, I really feel that this college, as time goes on, is going to figure out how best to serve the students. There's something about geographic isolation that is an advantage, because even though we've got a lot of students, we're still a small community, and we're sort of contained and insular. 90% of our graduates stay right here. People don't go away. So the value of our college in the community is something that is really known. And I, I'm just really proud to have had this. Um, my next steps will take me away from here and it will be sad. It, it will be sad, but I, I will be happy for what comes next. In those I want you to know I had a sad violin button, but I'm not gonna play it because I want you to be you. happy and sad <laughs> at the same time. As far as the future of higher education goes, uh, when I left AACC last April, I, I was optimistic. Um, there are some, there are some phenomenal young folks coming up who have the fire in the belly, and they will, they will figure it out. They will do things for the right reasons, and it, it's going to be a whole different world. I think there, I'm optimistic about community colleges because I believe that we will adapt more quickly than other sectors. We're used to it. Um, we're pretty creative, so. I have, I have a lot of hope that things will go well. I worry, uh, I worry that with the, the wealth gap is pretty wide in our country. We know which side community colleges serve disproportionately. And I, I worry that the things that we do to help people close that wealth gap for themselves and their families will not be recognized or funded as robustly as they need to be. Um, the funding model just absolutely needs to change. And people need to think about value very differently. Well, there you have it, ladies and gents. Um, I know one thing for sure, and that's the Yetup experience wishes you, Maureen, an amazing retirement. I hope you get to travel the world and see your family and do all the fun things that you haven't been able to do 
over the last couple of COVID years. I know people are kind of getting back to doing some fun stuff. So uh, we appreciate you coming on. Did you have a good ed up experience today? I had a terrific one. Thank you. I enjoyed this a lot, Joe. All right. Well, there she is, ladies and gentlemen. She is the president of the College of Southern Maryland, Dr. Maureen Murphy. You've just ed upped. Effective marketing for educational institutions requires a dedicated partner that understands the complex, constantly evolving digital landscape in which colleges, universities, and career schools compete. The EdUp Experience podcast partner, Advanced 360 Education, is a data-focused digital marketing company with proven positive outcomes for educational institutions. Advanced 360 Education does not simply rely on instinct to make assumptions about audiences or key data points. Through data intelligence, client strategies take on a higher level of effectiveness, whether the goal is driving enrollment, alumni engagement, or other educational marketing campaigns. To learn more, visit a360education.com or call Anthony Espinoza at 310-704-5369. That's Anthony Espinoza, 310-704-5369, a360education.com.